Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core Podcast, an award-winning podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and, with the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Kaprockman taylor In this episode, I hosted a roundtable discussion with Ashley Burke, Carla Reffold and Divya Mudgal about how they got into the cybersecurity industry, how you don't necessarily need a technical background or need to be a developer in order to get into it, and how there's way more to the industry than the sensationalist person in a hoodie typing random commands into a Linux bash prompt than you might have realized. We talk about the fact that both Ashley and Carla are from non-traditional backgrounds, i.e. they didn't study computer science or software engineering, and how their experience differs from Divya's experience as she studied computer science. Along the way, we also discuss some of the issues that they have faced as women in the cybersecurity industry, an industry which is traditionally very male-dominated. We also discuss ways that we can help our colleagues who identify as female. This is a slight departure from our standard topic of .NET and more into both cybersecurity and the gender divide in our industry, both topics that I have no expertise in. I only ask that you listen to what these highly skilled colleagues of ours have to say and think about what your key takeaways from this conversation are. For instance, some of my favourite key takeaways from this were Carla saying that sometimes it's just a case of getting out of the way, Divya saying it shouldn't be about male versus female and that we should combine each other's skills and experience to create a greater team, and Ashley saying that gender bias can present itself in some of the most subtle ways and that we should look to stop teaching those gender biases to our children. I also really appreciated having my viewpoint and a specific long-held understanding, one which I thought would help, but actually might have hurt, challenged and changed throughout this discussion. Let me know via the contact page at .netcore.show forward slash contact what your key takeaways from this discussion were. A late breaking note from the edit. It seems that the recorded audio is a little bit rough in places. Mark, our editor and podcast mastering expert, has done what he can to improve the audio where he can, but there are still some rough spots. I think that the conversation we had is a very important one, and as such I've taken the time to personally provide a full transcription of what was said. If you have trouble with the audio, please take some time to read through the full transcription of the episode found at .netcore.show, and there will be a link directly to it in your podcatcher. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .net new podcast, and let the show begin. So the first thing I'd like to say to everyone, uh, Carla, Ashley, and Divya, um, thank you ever so much for spending some time with me today. I really, really honestly appreciate it. Anyone who comes on the show, I'm super appreciative of them spending their time. So thank you all for that. No worries. It's great to be here. Yep. Same. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay. uh, So this episode is going to be a huge departure from what we normally talk about. We normally talk about .NET and .NET things, but what I thought is um, it would be really interesting to catch up with some industry experts like yourself um, and talk about how you all got into the different aspects of security within technology and how you don't necessarily need to have a huge amount of technical background knowledge to do it. This is not to say that you that none of you have the technical knowledge required, but obviously, you know, when, when we're watching TV shows about the security people, you know, we're watching... Mr. Robot or whatever, the, the sensationalized side of it is everyone sitting around with a hoodie typing esoteric commands into a Linux uh, uh, bash terminal and then suddenly the internet goes down for everybody, right? The, there's way more to it than just that. And I thought it might be interesting to some of the listeners to find out a little bit more about the different ways that they can get into this industry um, and perhaps a little bit more of like um, ha- how you all got in um, would you recommend courses or mentorship or whatever? And some of perhaps the issues that you see on a daily basis that are not necessarily related to the technology, right? I've often said, sorry, I'm waffling on way too much. I will let everyone speak in a moment. I've often said that 
this whole space is dominated by too many people who look like me, right? And it shouldn't be. It should be for everybody. And so let's make it easier for everybody. If in my small area of the internet, I can help to get the, the message out, then let's make it fewer people that look like me. Anyway, I've talked for way too long. Um, would, would it be possible for you all to go around the circle and just sort of introduce yourselves? Because it shouldn't be the Jamie podcast, right? That's not allowed. Well, I'll jump in. So I'm Carla Reffold. I'm the general manager at Orpheus Cyber. We're a threat-led risk rating and vulnerability prioritization uh, cybersecurity vendor. So that's me. Um, I'll let everyone else go and then we can maybe jump into the how we got into it and what's different about what we what we do based on what you just said. Uh, I'm Ashley. I am not, I'm very new to the cybersecurity world. Thanks to Carla. Thank you. Um, pretty much I've had multiple roles already from a risk analyst to my current role being a program security, uh, uh, security program manager. So pretty much I'm running audits. I'm doing educational pieces for a fintech, a fintech out of Toronto. Okay, now I'll go next. Um, I'm Divya Mudgar. I have around eight years of experience in cybersecurity, uh, mostly doing penetration testing, working for different clients from different industries, uh, leading teams and projects. Uh, I have also I have uh, helped uh, software development teams in integrating security in software development lifecycle uh, using different industry standards uh, such as OVASP, SENSE. Uh, currently, I'm working as senior security engineer with one of the financial product firms in Toronto. And uh, so basically, uh, now I am doing penetration testing and doing uh, more uh, security things like uh, working on policies, uh, doing uh, uh, maybe help in audit and all sorts of different things. Well, my route into cybersecurity is probably a little different from most people these days. I was, um, I had my own recruitment business and we were looking at risk and enterprise risk and business continuity. And someone who I trusted very much said, you know what, you should really look at this cybersecurity thing. I think it's going to be big. So we did. And then very quickly doubled down and cybersecurity was all we did. So my route into the industry was from the point of uh, recruiting and helping people get into get into cyber, grow their cyber teams, grow their cyber businesses. And then about two years ago, I moved from running that business to to Orpheus and uh, running the business with the CEO there. So now my role is a lot more technical. I feel like I'm actually in the industry rather than working for the industry, but it's a very different route. And I think goes to show that there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different roles that count as cyber. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more to that. Um, my route actually is very similar because I'm not technical. I started out as a university professor in political science, teaching in uh, indigenous communities, and realized as much as I love that role, it was like there was con it was contractual, so I wasn't able to get a full time role out of that. So I switched again to help people find jobs and careers. So similar to Carla, I did sort of recruiting. Um, but more the educational piece, teaching people how to network and make resumes. But I really wasn't happy. I didn't like the environment. Um, I just found that I was underutilized. And I kept, as I'm helping people finding jobs, I kept being more interested in security. So people who would come in and talk about security, I was so psyched. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, I need to know more about this. And I actually wrote a note to myself in my office that said, you will get into cybersecurity like a little note to myself to remind me I'm going to do it. COVID hit. There you go. And I went, well, it's about time. So um, from there, ended up with mentors such as Carla, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, and literally just started networking and talking, took a few courses, but like I took a web development course and it turns out I really hate web development. So I wasn't going to do that. And I was like, how can I get in? Through talking, through networking, I landed an interview for Risk and got in that way. And almost right away, I was approached by the security manager being like, so you want to come do a little work for us? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you do. And now I work there full time. It was awesome. 
Uh, for me, uh, it actually started uh, during my graduation. Uh, while I was uh, uh, in my graduation, I wanted to become a Java developer and I, I worked on some projects as a software developer. So while I was learning Java and working on different projects, I came to know about issues such as like SQL injection, XSS, and then I started uh, learning about secure code in Java. I read OVAS top 10 and different uh, resources available on, you know, from different uh, resources available on internet. While I was reading about it, I found it interesting and wanted to explore uh, offensive web, web application security. Uh, so I started reading about it more and more and uh, then uh, looking for, started looking for suitable positions and then finally landed my first job as a penetration testing. So that's how I got into cybersecurity. You know, I think what Ashley's story kind of highlights for me is some of the advice that I've given people over the years is try and look internally first. Try and look for ways of getting involved with cybersecurity teams in your current business to get some of that experience. Because we're seeing this like time and time again right now, right? Like, yes, there's courses. Yes, some people go into graduate roles or intern roles. But getting that experience, which really catapults you, is that's really hard. And that's one of the first ways you can do it by you know, even one project with the teams that you currently work with. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think I know that we were we're going to talk about this, but I feel it's important to bring it up now is the idea of mentorship. Um, so being a non-traditional woman, so like I'm a woman in a non-traditional field or trying to enter a non-traditional field, you know, facing a lot of challenges, having mentorship was super helpful. And I went out of my way. Carla, for example, was my mentor um, and I met Carla on a Twitter feed when she put out that she was accepting mentees. <laughs> like, that's how that happened. And from there, Carla has helped me, you know, when I first started, I had two job offers. Carla helped me navigate that. Who should, what should I be looking for in these job offers? I didn't know. I'm new to this industry. You know, the idea of mentorship and lifting other women up to succeed is incredibly important in this field. You know, this is a male dominated field and, there's a lot of mansplaining that happens. There's a lot of perspective of, oh, we think of that. If we think of that hacker in the hoodie, it's a white man, right? It's not usually like a happening cool ass woman, you know, deciding to take down the government. Not usually happening, right? And so I think it's pretty cool that we help each other up and we start mentoring other women or, you know, diversity in general, to engage and grow in this field. You know, so for me, like my heart is with Carla because Carla looked at me and said, we got this. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to help you. And I was lucky enough to have two amazing women as my mentors. And I think that's really important to put out there. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Ash. Uh, mentors play an important role in my journey as well. So uh, I met different people, uh, throughout my journey and be it my colleagues seniors men women uh, but they mentored me guided me supported me throughout my journey obviously there were ups and downs but uh, my focus is always and will always be to uh, basically be learn as much as possible when wherever and whenever i can i think like a couple of things i always think when i talk about mentorship is my mentors don't know they're my mentors. I've never asked them, say, I, I mean, maybe they've got a clue, but like they're really great people that have taken the time to meet me for breakfast on occasion or will take a call from me when I need some help. And I don't think it always has to be as formal as we think. You know, Ashley and I met on Twitter. We talk when she wants to talk. Like it's not necessarily, you know, we don't have calls booked in. And the other really important thing, and Ashley again is a great example, is she does the work, right? Like, you know, my style is a little more coaching rather than telling. Um, and I think sometimes you see that when, when people come and want to find a mentor, like they're looking for someone to say, do this, you know, to tell them what to do. And that's part of it. But part of it is you have to then go and do those things. 
Yeah, I think that's a reasonable point. Like for my experience being new in this field, and I am new so far, just, you know, with my mentorship, being new, taking on, I've literally just taken on any opportunity I can find that I feel that I'd enjoy. I've managed to run an audit. I've ran a security project, a security privacy project. I've like the things I've helped us with our PCI certification. I've done PII training, all these amazing things in a year. And I think personally, when it comes to this, and it is, you know, the idea of what Carla and Divi are saying is there's ups and downs, but you put in that work. And ultimately, like I'm a go-getter, I know that, and I will literally, I will fight tooth and nail for something I believe in. If I think I can succeed at it, I'm going to do it. And when you have that support, and I say this because it's important that when you have that support from other women in the field, particularly, it actually lifts you up, right? So Divya and I are actually in the same company, and we are the only two women on our security team. You know, we're very lucky. Everyone else on the team is very supportive. They're, you know, I would classify them as feminists, but Divya and I support on each other. We lean on each other and we talk to each other because we know our issues might be different. Our challenges might be different than other people on that team. Yeah. Yeah, I am, um, you know, I started when there were very few women in cybersecurity. I'm kind of annoyed that it's going so well for us because now the lines to the bathrooms are much longer at these conferences. That is not what I signed up for. But <laughs> joking aside, like, it's really important to have those relationships and to support each other. There is a great network of women in cybersecurity because... There are actually, like, most of the industry is awesome. There's some not-so-nice elements as well, and I think we're seeing typically groups of women call that out and try and try and get rid of that. But um, I think if you can find that group or those people that will support you, then it's going to make your journey just that little bit easier. Mm-hmm. I agree. I've actually, <laughs> when I started this, like, even before, when I was super interested in tech, this is like a tiny story, just showcase and as an example, when I was super interested in tech, um, I was working in a different field. I was like, well, I'm going to start on an IT committee because we actually had a cyber attack. We had a ransomware attack. And I was like, whoa, what? Okay, how are we going to deal with this? So me and the IT guy took security super serious, though it wasn't our job. We went around all the computers. I think there was probably 30 or 40 in the business. And we updated everything. We had people change their password. And we're like, okay, let's do an education to showcase the people who are influenced what to do if. Um, And I had an upper, like someone above me come to my office and very much state to me, you cannot do that anymore. Your job is this. And they put their hands together and made like a very small space and said, this is what you do. Your job is specifically what you're doing. You cannot join that committee. You cannot be part of that. And that's where I started facing that adversity of, well, who says I can't do what I want to do? Like, no, that's not going to (laughs) happen. You know, and that's where my downfall started, right? In the sense of the, the fields I was in weren't for me. This is where I wanted to be. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted, I wanted to be on the IT committee. So I made my own. (laughs) But, you know, like that's stuff that you deal with. And it's not always in the forefront. You're not always seeing it out in front. It's happening in back offices. Luckily, I uh, did not face anything like at least till now uh, where I faced uh, like because you are a woman, you can't do that. Uh, In fact, in my case, everyone was uh, so supportive of uh, basically motivating me and do stuff. So uh, maybe I was lucky. (laughs) I mean, maybe. I've certainly had a bit of both. You know, I don't think anyone's told me I can't do things, um, but there's definitely been times where I feel I've created my own opportunities. You know, that door doesn't exist. You go build one. And that's, um, that's not always obvious. Sometimes you need someone to point out that that's possible to you. Um, but, you know, I think what I see from women in this field is how much we tend to do. 
when I have judged awards, you get um, like a CISO category it tends to be mostly men, and they all say, "Hey, I do my job and I do it really well." And you, then you get the women category, uh, like a woman of influence or something like that, and they say, "Well, I do my job and I do it really well." And I've got three kids and I have a philanthropic association and I go into schools and tell people about cyber security and I attract women. And last year I attracted, I don't know, a dozen women into the field and help them out. And I mentor them in my spare time. Like we're doing a lot to stay, um, to get to the same place. I see that all the time. And I'm really hopeful that maybe this, uh, you know, this next iteration for women in cyber is that actually we can do our jobs and that's enough. Or, or we're doing more and we're getting ahead for doing more rather than being, you know, staying in the same place. If you're enjoying this show, would you mind sharing it with a friend or colleague? Check out Podcatcher for a link to the show notes, which has an embedded player within it and a transcription and all that stuff, and share that link with them. I'd really appreciate it if you could indeed share the show. But if you'd like a few other ways to support it, you could uh, leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. So if you head over to .net core.show slash review, you'll find loads of ways to do that. You could consider buying the show a coffee. The Buy Me A Coffee link is available on each show's show notes page on the website. This is a one-off financial support option. You could become a patron. This is a monthly subscription-based financial support option, and the link to that is included on each episode show notes page as well. I'd love it if you could share the show with a friend or colleague, or leave a rating or review. The other options are completely up to you, and are not required at all to continue enjoying the show. Anyway, let's get back to it. Is there, um, related to, to the points that you've all brought up, and especially the point that you brought up there, Carla, about, um, about, about uh, women always doing more, right? You were saying there about, you know, I don't want to quote you back to you, but like, you know, I do this and I, and I go to schools and I do outreach and I do mentorship and I do all these things. And I have, you know, because of the gender normative society we're in and I look after the children and I do the housework. And I hate that I've had to just say that, but you know, that, that, that's what I was getting from. What, is there anything that, um, that, um, I suppose male or masculine presenting people can do to help. If, 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 if I'm already in a technology area, uh, you know, I'm a developer. So is there anything that I could do to help other than just, so I've been, I've been told several times the best way to do, to be there is, is the best way to support is to be there, listen and be an ally, right? Say, hey, cool. This person, she's awesome. You want to hire this person, right? But is that the best I can do or should I be doing more? Because I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to sit here. I do, I hate to use this phrase, but too much. That's the wrong way to say it. But like, I don't want to be sitting here and going, well, I'm going to mansplain my way through this, but how, how can I, how can I help other people? Even if it's not my, my area of expertise, is it just a case of knowing enough people and saying, oh, you want to talk to Carla and you want to talk to Ashley and you want to talk to Divya because they are awesome. Let me get you in contact with them. Or is there something else I should be doing? Like, what should I do? <laughs> you know, that's a great question because part of the problem is men don't always know what to do, right? You know, do you want to be the person that goes into schools and tells young girls that cybersecurity is a place for women? That's kind of a hard thing for you to take on. Um, I think all of the things that you just said around, you know, how you are an ally, how do you, if you're asked to recommend somebody, are there women on your list? How diverse is that list of people that you're presenting? And actually, sometimes, can you just get out of the way? Like, can you be quiet in a meeting so that the females in the, the room can speak and have that place? Because... We know that, you know, all those norms of how people are perceived and, you know, when women try to create that space, can you create that for them? So, yeah, there's a whole list I could carry on, carry on for far longer than we have. But those are kind of the things that are coming top of mind. I'm totally with Carla on this. Like so many times men speak over us or they don't let us have our discussion. You know, I think another way that you can absolutely support women in this industry is ask us questions. Don't make any assumptions. Don't make assumptions, A, that we have children. I don't. I'm never having kids. In fact, I don't I don't really like kids. 
that's okay. Right. And I'm going to say that so everyone will know. <laughs> I'm asked way too many times when I'm having a baby. <laughs> I'm over it. Um, you know, that ask us questions, make zero assumptions. You know, there's too many assumptions made on women that aren't right. You know, oh, you know, she probably has to go take care of children. Oh, she's probably off because, oh, it's that time of her month. Whatever BS this is, stop. Ask us questions. Engage with us. Ask us our opinions. You know, women have different perspectives. And it has, from studies I've read, it has been shown that women are incredibly successful in cybersecurity because our brains work just a little bit different. You know, and that's all right. Like, I think that's pretty cool. And since being in security, and I can speak for myself at least, I have gained so much confidence in my ability, in my voice, and what I can accomplish. And you can ask, Divi, I never shut up in a meeting. I am consistent. But it's because I feel my opinion is important and valid. And to help us, ask, validate, you know, be part of that, be part of our journey. You're right when you said networking. Networking is super cool. You know, I'm fine if you want to put people my way to have discussions. I think that's great. But it's ultimately, you know, not mansplaining, no assumptions. And I love how you said it, Carla, get out of our way. <laughs> what a nice way to put it. <laughs> I'm not sure how nice that is. But it, <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes it is that, you know, like, and, and sometimes it is saying, hey, as a man, I'm leaving to pick up the kids because if we make everything normal for everybody, um, then that, you know, then that stops it being, women stop being penalized because they're doing that when the men say that they're doing that. Something came up this week around why do I have my pronouns on my LinkedIn profile? Well, because if I do it, it's then safe for other people to do it. You just make that normal. And it's the same thing uh, when it comes down to kind of the, the gender split as well. Yeah, I feel like uh, it should never be uh, male versus female. Uh, if if uh, someone has skill and uh, someone can help with that skill, be it opinion or I can have my opinion and I can uh, basically maybe contribute to something. So it should not be uh, something like it because she is a female or she is a woman, she can maybe better know this. Or if he is a man, he maybe he can better know it. it it's all about skills and experience and knowledge that, that an individual has. I, I love that point. I love everything you've, you've all just said. I think it's all completely, you are the experts in this, in this place, right? I, how do I put it? I, I always... So I, I always try to pick my words very carefully when I'm talking to anyone, but um, specifically this, I feel like I need to pick my words a little bit more carefully, and that is um, I I will never understand, I might, I might appreciate, but I'll never understand the issues that face different groups of people, right? Um, one of my friends once said to me, dude, you're playing life on easy mode. You're a white cisgendered male. you got it easy. And and I'm not I'm not saying that anybody has it easy. I'm not saying that people don't have it hard. I'm just saying you know that's what one person said to me. Um, and and I feel like um, I feel like yeah, you're right. We we maybe maybe you know as as white cisgendered men need to just step aside and shut up, <laughs> which is the opposite of what I'm doing. <laughs> I okay yeah. I mean yeah, for sure that some people may have it easier than others or they may not. We don't know what people go through and what their lives are. But for security in a general perspective, diversity is your friend. Let's look at a hiring managers, for example. You know, it's not just about ticking boxes. It's about diversity. If we're looking at technical skills versus non-technical, you know, look at a person as a whole. You know, um, like sometimes... Women are penalized because maybe we do have to leave. And if you look at COVID, for example, women have been the ones that have suffered the most in the workforce, right? And why is that? It's back to Carla's point of let's normalize the divide of, you know, I don't have children, but for me personally, it would be let's normalize chores 
for example, right? I'm not, I'm a horrible cleaner. I know this. <laughs> like, I am awful at this. Um, and if you put me, I don't know, if you put me in a place where I had to clean as a profession, I would fail miserably. <laughs> and that's okay. But, you know, it is, it's that gender divide that we have to conquer. And it's to Divya's point that it's about skills. It's not about, you know, who, like, it's not necessarily that, oh, well, you're a woman, let me tick this box. Oh, you have a disability, let me tick this box. It's the fact being that women in general, in a holistic sense, have skills and abilities and look at things a little bit different. You know, and that's never bad. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I think what we're maybe going to sort of, we're touching on it, is that it should be about skills. It should be about experience. It's not about ticking boxes. And people people get worried about that sometimes. I'm worried about then how do I get a diverse team? And I think, you know, that cognitive diversity comes into it too. So I feel like you need to have different lived experiences in your team, which is creating your cognitive diversity by having diverse people in your team. And you, I think about it like when you build a sports team, right? Your best athletes might be, and I'm going to do soccer because that's the one I know the best. Your best athletes might be 11 strikers. But you can't have a team of 11 strikers. You have to get some defenders and some midfielders. And actually, even if the best athlete available doesn't fit with your team, you're not going to take that person just because they happen to be the best athlete. You're going to take the best fit for your team. And sometimes that might mean that highly qualified women versus highly qualified men but you don't have any women on your team that woman becomes the best fit so that's how I think about it when people are getting concerned about well how do I you know men v women and you know how do I tick some boxes it's about creating the best possible team and some of that team creation is diversity and diversity of lived experiences and maybe that means the interview should change a little bit Carla you know, because when you're doing a, an interview, sometimes it is very like, okay, here's your intro. What's your name? What's your experience? What's your strength? Okay, tell me about this time blank. But maybe, and I really love that, maybe it should be not about necessarily all your work experience, but also your lived experience. You know, tell me, have you traveled before? Where have you traveled? Why did you like it? What did you do there? You know, it's all about, and this is bringing me back to my career days but it's all about transferable skills, right? We have so many transferable skills, like thousands, one person, and no skill is the same because a person who owns that skill is different, right? So utilize it in a way of asking about personal, you know, and not like super personal, but that person as a whole, right? I, I love that point. There's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a related story, or at least a story that I think is quite related into how uh, both Carla and Ashley, how you've both described this, this diversity of thought, this diversity of everything. Um, and that I believe it's the New York Philharmonic. I may be completely incorrect as to which Philharmonic it is, because there are millions of them. Um, they found in the early 2000s that they were hiring people based on how they look. Oh, we need more male cellists. We need more female cellists. We need more... Um, you know, African-American tuba players or whatever, whatever instrument it is that they were looking for. And they found that even having the people, so what they would do is they would have the musician walk on stage with their instrument, introduce themselves, and then play a piece of music. And so what they did was they had the, they then, they changed that so that then the people watching the audition who are making the decisions would turn their backs the person will walk on stage, would introduce themselves, and then play the piece of music. They were still picking more men than women. So then they dropped the introduce yourself. You just walk on stage, play a piece of music, and you're done. Then they found they were still hiring more men. Because what they noticed was um, they were hearing the click-clack of the high heels and going subconsciously going, oh, that's a woman. And so what they did was they're, they're still facing the wrong way. They have... The, uh, the curtain drawn and they have the musicians come on barefoot and play music and they're now iterating towards a 50-50 split of um, masculine presenting and feminine presenting musicians so just spitballing a potentially silly idea maybe we should do tech uh, tech based job interviews like that right you don't have a camera like in the world we're in where everyone's remote you don't have your camera on 
and you just talk about like you both were saying there about these are my lived experiences these are my transferable skills so then you don't have that immediate hit of oh well this is a masculine person or this is a feminine person or this is a african-american person or this is a person of asian descent or, or whatever right you you get rid of those cognitive biases maybe that's a good idea i don't know i'm not sure if that would get rid of cognitive biases though because you're still, you're still okay. going to have inflection in voice, right? You're still going to have, but I think the point you're making is the idea of gender bias, right? So when we, and I, we've already touched on this a bit, is that when we think of a woman, right? So, you know, okay, so I think of a woman, first thing that comes into mind, maybe, and this isn't me, this would be me talking for everyone else, maybe I'm not 100% sure, but a stereotype would be children, Empathy, you know, um, like runs a household. It wouldn't necessarily be a boss, an entrepreneur, right? Uh, you know, it could be a great decision maker, an Olympic athlete. There's an amazing sports person. Like women are bigger than the stereotypes that are given to us. And this goes to your point where you're asking again, what can I do? It's getting rid of these assumptions and these stereotypes. But it's hard when that's ingrained in you. When it's ingrained that a woman makes sandwiches. Again, I make a horrible sandwich. Like you do not want to have me as a housewife because the house will be awful and you won't eat. <laughs> like straight up. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately that's where it's at that we need to find a way and – Maybe it is through education. You know, it is hard to change a way of thinking if you've necessarily thought that way for a long period. And when you had these nuclear traditional families where this is how you've grown up, it's hard to change that perspective. But there's no reason that we can't work around that and get through that. There's, um, there's a lot of examples like that, you know, blind CVs to so no names on CVs and how that makes a difference in the recruiting process. And if you think about it, we've changed how women are perceived and how women work over a very short period of time, if you think about it in terms of human history. And actually, we all have those biases. There's a Harvard uh, bias test that I've taken. I'm biased against women, according to that test. Like, that will probably surprise you. But if you then look at how I've grown up and the things that I've experienced through work, maybe it makes a little more sense. So actually knowing that I have that bias is the thing that helps me keep a check on it. Because if I find myself thinking a certain way about somebody, I stop and I just say, all right, if this person was a man doing this same thing, how would I feel about them? And if I think I would feel differently, I try and reassess. So I don't know that you can get rid of your biases. I don't think we can design processes that eliminate them. I think we have to own it as people to try and do the best that we can do um, and to make those those changes. It's education, right? It's education and personal change. It's create goals for yourself and try to accomplish them. Uh, I, I, I like that because like, that makes me happy because that means that whether it's next year, whether it's, I would hope it's sooner than 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But this means to me that we can iterate towards a better world, right? Because in that mythical, perfect world, right, I have to do the sort of bunny quotes or whatever around it. At the moment, I have to do the bunny quotes around the word perfect world. Um, going back to Divya's point of view about, it's about skills. I, I, all, all three of you have made the same point. It's about the skills. It's about the technique. It's about the the, the transferable experience, the diversity of, of thought was a wonderful uh, phrase used by uh, Carla, I believe. Uh, if, we can, if we can educate the current and next generation of people who are going to take these roles and, and support everyone around them to, to, to go, hey, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, of, of this particular vision of a person, throw that out of the window because it's got nothing to do with the reality. Then, in my opinion, we'll we'll iterate towards a much better place. We'll iterate to that, towards that point where we'll be sitting in an interview and someone will come in and we won't see um, uh, race. We won't see gender. We won't see any of the identities or anything like that. We'll still see the person, but like in, in our minds, we'll be, think, we'll be thinking, right, okay, this person has come in, answer the questions. They are perfect through, through what they've said, through the way they've presented themselves to us. 
It's got nothing to do with their identity. It's got nothing to do with their background or anything like that. This person is perfect. It also happens to be that they are female and, and a bunch of other things or attributes are brilliant, whatever. That didn't matter. What mattered was this person came in, answered all the questions, provided us with some knowledge, and we've learned and moved on, right? That's where I want to be. And so if if all that, if all, here come the money quotes again, if all that takes is, you know, I can go into a school and say, look, let's talk about gender biases. I don't want to talk about technology. Let's talk about gender biases and do that, that education rather than let's talk about getting into the business. I am more than happy to do it, but I have no knowledge of that. <laughs> I'm not the expert here. <laughs> well, I think you do, though, because didn't you like you're already declaring and saying that you recognize that you're the norm. You're recognizing that there's too many of you. And I say that paraphrasing what you're saying. Um, mm-hmm. There's too many of you in the industry. That's the start to where your goal is. Right. So ultimately, yeah, like you're on the right path. Yeah, you're getting there. But I, th- I think that, yeah, talking about gender bias and maybe there has to be a little bit more talk and discussion in security about this. You know, I, I say this because women, we're entering the field. You're not going to stop us, right? No one's going to stop us. We're coming hard and we're coming fast. And every, if we put our mind to it, we will rock anything we touch, right? And this is why I love being a woman. I love it. I just, I adore being who I am what I am now. And you, there's no stopping. It's just supporting, right? So uh, this is where it comes into that play of asking questions, you know, getting to know us as people, not just as a stereotype. Jamie, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. Like that perfect world, I think that's like such a, a future state. And I think it's a nice goal to have but I think we're very many years away from now and why I'm going to disagree with you is I think we when we say that that's our goal it gives people an excuse to say well that's how I do it I don't you know I don't judge people on their race or their gender so we're in that perfect world and that means they ignore some of their own biases because they deny that they have them and I think it means they ignore the equity piece because actually people you know, that whole I don't see race thing is is not what people are saying they want. You know, they're saying, actually, I want you to see me as a black person and I want you to recognize my experience is different. And then I want you to enable me to do my best at work around that. So I think we're just far away from that. And I would have said the same thing a few years ago, but I'm really changing my opinion on what I think our goal state should be for the next few years. I think that's a good point because... Yeah. You can't, if whatever, if my gender is female, you can't not see my gender. And in fact, I want you to see my gender. Like, that's who I am. And, you know, it's the same thing, Carly, you're right, with someone who, you know, is black. Well, you know, the color of their skin can be part of their culture, and their culture is important for who they are as a person. So why wouldn't they want you to see that? Right? That's them as a whole. That's incredibly important to their identity. And to be very frank, I want to see that. I want to know more about your culture. I want to learn more about your identity, your experiences. Like, tell me and tell me when I'm wrong. Let's engage in conversation. And one thing that is missing ultimately is conversation. Uh, personally, uh, my take on this is uh, because uh, it's not just about industry, cybersecurity and on our job. In day to day, we face uh, this issue. So, uh, my take on this is basically talk to people, try to get their perspective on things and uh, don't make a perception for a person like uh, based on what they are. Uh, instead, just go and talk to them and try to understand their thoughts and uh, why are they? Uh, why do they feel in that way maybe that might change things basically talk to people don't make a judgment and perception and uh, be try to be at their place and try to understand their po- uh, their point do you know what i love that i got that wrong because this means that i've learned something right and that sounds really hand wavy and, and oh look jamie's but i genuinely mean that right it means that i've now um started that journey of growing as a person and understanding a little bit better so thank you all for that for for 
for correcting me on that because I really appreciate that. It isn't, like you say, it isn't about don't say this, don't say that. It's about accepting it and just saying, look, okay, cool. Yeah, talk to me. I absolutely agree. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so what I would what I would say is, right, we've only got about uh, two or three minutes left in our allotted time of talking today. I was wondering if, um, if uh, any of you have any um, top tips for people who want to get into the industry. Um, and then perhaps if you wanted to, if you have any um, uh, links or, or socials to share, please make, you know, if, if we have time, do share them. If we don't, just send them to me afterwards, after the recording. I'll put them in the show notes. Anything we've talked about today, going in the show notes. So does anyone have any top tips on how to get into the industry and, uh, and all that kind of stuff? So my main one is network. You know, there's so many stats and I won't bore everyone with them, but, you know, applying for jobs is is hard when you're trying to get into the industry. So network and network in places where, you know, you are comfortable. So, you know, it might be like Ashley did with Twitter. It might be in person. Go where you're comfortable and you can be at your best and and try and um, add value in those interactions. If someone approaches me and says, have you got a job? I can't really do very much with that. But if someone approaches me and says, hey, would you spend 15 minutes to talk to me about getting into the industry? Then I will absolutely do that. And then the flip side of that is if you are hiring, because we've talked a lot about diversity on, on this call, how diverse is your own network? Because most jobs do go to your network. But if your network is made up of people that look like you, then you are not going to get a diverse team. So think about making sure that your own network as a hiring manager is diverse. Too. I agree. I actually, um, something really cool happened to me recently where I had a, like an, a goal inside me that I wanted to speak at an event. I wanted someone to ask me to do it and it happened where they were referred to me and now I'm speaking tomorrow at the Open Security Summit. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm actually speaking on this exact point of why you don't need to be technical to get into security and going through my journey of not being technical to networking and mentorship and transferable skills and then confidence building. Um, one tip I'm definitely going to give is imposter syndrome is real. Okay. So sometimes if you're new to the industry or maybe you just want to change careers in the industry, imposter syndrome a hundred percent is real, but don't let it bring you down. You know, yes, network, find mentors if you can, um, one thing that I did, and I'm still suffering from imposter syndrome, I still don't know if I belong in security. You know, every day I'm brought up with something, an uh, acronym, I have no idea what it means. No idea. So I just Google it. But I don't know everything. And that's okay. All right? And I have to continuously remind myself. But when that comes, write your skills down. Write what you've accomplished, how you've accomplished it. Why are you, what are you good at? Look back at it. Go to your mentors and make make conversation with people on your team. Let them know how you're feeling. You know, I think one thing that happens is women uh, in tech, I would think, feel like if I show vulnerability, then it shows that, oh, God, I don't know what I'm talking about or it's weakness because it's a male-dominated field. I have to be a certain way, but you don't. You know, be authentically you. If this is how you feel, it's okay because your feelings are valid. Right. And you'll grow and you expand and ultimately keep conversations going. Talk about it you know, and really just challenge yourself and you'll be great. Um, Carla and Ashley already covered it. Uh, networking is very important. Uh, basically, go talk to people, know about their experiences and uh, know what challenges uh, and problems they faced and they are facing on day-to-day -day basis. List down your strength and uh, identify like th these are the strengths and these are the problems that people are facing. So how I am going to overcome these things if I can do this. So it's, it's not like doubting yourself, but everyone has their own strength, uh, interest and everything. So uh, know about those and read about it because cybersecurity is a very technical field. You need to be stay updated and read about things on day-to-day -day basis. There are new attacks, vulnerabilities, uh, and uh, 
basically new things coming up so just read about it talk to people and uh, i think that's my tip excellent thank you so much um are, are there any uh, socials or websites you, you would all share out or should i just collect those from you offline and we can throw them into the show notes okay sure Yep, uh, I'm also very, very aware that we're running very short on on the minutes during the, the that we have for the recording. So, uh, what I'll say, is thank you ever, all ever so much uh, for taking this up because I, I say this after at the end of every episode, but this one, I definitely learned a whole bunch of new stuff, and I'm going to go and change the way that I see the world, and hopefully make my corner of it a little bit better. That's my goal. So, thank you. All, you've all helped me do that. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Jamie, for doing this. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. That was a roundtable discussion with Ashley Burke, Carla Reffold, and Divya Mudgall about getting into the cybersecurity industry. Be sure to check the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, head over to .netcore.show forward slash review for ways to do that. Or to reach out via our contact page at .netcore.show forward slash contact. And to come back next time for more .net goodness. Remember, I'd love to hear your key takeaways from this episode, so do get in touch. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited.